Let's uh, uh, resume our session. Uh, in welcome everyone, uh, friends and followers of uh, anarchism, to this uh, session on uh, anarcho-feminism. I'm very happy to be able to introduce three of our speakers uh, today, whom I will introduce in the order of their appearance on stage. The first one is uh, uh, Mitchell Werther who is a PhD student, PhD candidate here in the philosophy department and the new school. He works, uh, he's writing his dissertation on uh, anarchism, feminism, and ecology. He is also uh, the editor of Dreams of Freedom and the author of several papers on Levinas, and uh, I understand that he's also interested in, uh, um, in, in um, anarchism and in Kropotkin in particular. Our second speaker is uh, Cinzia Aruza, who is uh, assistant professor of philosophy here at, at the New School um, in the philosophy department. She just uh, joined us uh, this year, and so far we've been very happy with her teaching and research. She has an in enormous, remarkable breadth, breadth and depth at the same time, something that we uh, uh, try to practice here at the New School. She, uh, for example, her dissertation um, she defended at, uh, in Rome at the University Tor Vergata is on uh, Plotinus Origines and Gregory of Nyssa, so expectedly. But uh, of course she also uh, writes and works on uh, uh, political philosophy, on Marxism in uh, uh, particular, on Marxism and Feminism. She uh, spent some time in the universities of uh, Fribourg in Switzerland and uh, Bonn in Germany. And uh, uh, her most recent work is uh, appeared in Italian. It's called Le Relazioni Pericolose, uh, Dangerous uh, Relations uh, on uh, Marxism and Feminism. And this book, I understand, is now translated into English and will uh, appear soon. And finally, our third speaker, I'm very happy to be able to welcome her, is uh, Laura Corradi, who is uh, a, a scholar, an activist, uh, um, who got her PhD from the University of California at uh, Santa Cruz, and currently is a research professor at the University of uh, Calabria in uh, um, Italy, but also uh, spends uh, quite a bit of her time in uh, uh, India, teaching there. Um, her, uh, she's the author of, uh, uh, of a number of books about uh, uh, women, women in night shift in particular, AIDS prevention, uh, and uh, several articles on uh, women health, everyday life, and uh, activism. She's also the editor of the Italian country report on women's health for European <coughs> Women Health uh, Network and a co-author of the Handbook for Women's Health. So please join me in welcoming our speakers. I, I'm going to stand if that's okay with everybody. Um, I just like standing. Um, so I, yeah, thank you to, uh, to Jacob and to Simon and to uh, Chiara for putting this together. Thank you all for coming here and uh, whatever, joining us in conversation. Um, yeah. So all right, um, already at its roots, uh, anarchism is deeply feminist. When we consult uh, Greek literature, we see that the term anarchy was first used in an active, anti-political sense to describe the behavior of a sister, Antigone, who rose up in rebellion against her uncle, Creon, and Creon literally means ruler, uh, to rebel against the military logic of fraternity and fratricide, a logic which divides humanity into friends who are loyal to the state and to enemies that betray it. Now she's denounced as an anarchist in both Aeschylus's and Sophocles' account of her tragedy, and Antigone opposes this antagonistic logic in the name of a more ethical mode of human interconnection, one that affirms that we uh, must unconditionally nurture each other 
even beyond the moment of death. The link between uh, feminism and anarchism has similarly been noted in the writings of anarcho-feminists, such as in Lynn Farrow, uh, her 1974 proclamation that, quote, feminism practices what anarchism preaches. One might go as far as to claim that feminists are the only existing protest groups that can honestly be called practicing anarchists. So in this talk, I will continue to pursue the ideas suggested by the example of Antigone and the statement of Lynn Farrow to argue that there is a deep connection between feminist thought and the project of anarchism. I will do so by claiming that various feminist critiques of patriarchy can allow us to reconsider and to remember the significance of anarchism. Now, before we uh, consider the importance of the feminist critique, let me begin by asking, what are the aims and the aspirations of anarchism? Anarchism is sometimes is, is, is defined simply as the refusal of the state. However, anarchism must strive toward a much more profound goal than this. The long history of authoritarian domination has penetrated our ways of thinking and of acting so deeply that an anarchist critique must reevaluate the very roots of political philosophy, of the thinking that considers communality of being together in terms of political association. Now, the feminist scholar uh, Nancy Hartsock argues that the Western political thinking has been shaped by the way that the Greek polis, the city-state, emerged out of what she terms the barracks community. Within this military encampment, the paradigmatic virtues were defined as courage, heroism, glory, and the striving for immortality. Human relationships were conceived as being fundamentally antagonistic and competitive as struggles for domination and for power. Hartsock further claims that war and the masculine role of the warrior hero have been central to our conception of politics ever since. For example, the warrior's dominance on the physical battlefield has been transformed into the citizen's domination on the battlefield of rhetoric and into the businessman's uh, dominance on the field of commerce. Now, in addition to this prevalence of uh, military logic within mainstream conceptions of politics, I would further add that it determines too much content within various strands of radical thinking, from Marx's belief that class struggle is the engine of history, to Badiou's celebration of the militant as the model for political subjectivity, most alarming for me, however, is the way that such militarism runs through the writings of the French tycoon group. Within these texts, we find the standard masculinist warnings against the way that one is, quote, castrated by mass society, as well as a hostile denunciation of the figure of the, quote, young girl, who represents for them, and it's not well, and it represents for them basically the shallow bitch who uh, succumbs to the idiocy of consumer culture. Um, worse yet, one finds recurrent calls to violence. Not only does it proclaim that, quote, war is the truth of relations between communities, the text's introduction to civil war tells us, quote, only the timid atom of imperial society thinks of violence as a radical and unique evil. For us, ultimately, violence is what has been taken from us, and today we need to take it back. We are similarly informed uh, that hostility is a primordial relationship and that, quote, the hostess is a nothing that dem demands to be annihilated. Now, clearly, some sort of revolution will be necessary to, di to disarm the elite who oppress and immiserate the mass of humanity by their maintenance of power, property, and violence. In this paper, however, I will insist that it is even more important to recover models of subjectivity and sociality that do not follow this military model. Is the political conception of human sociality sufficient to describe our relationships with each other? And more importantly, should it be the basis for imagining our anarchist future? Part of the problem, I believe, is that we tend to think of human sociality as being already saturated by politics. That we subscribe either to the Hegelian vision that the state is the transcendental sphere, 
which sustains all other particular affiliations, or to the Foucauldian vision of an imminent micropolitics that determines and disciplines all intimate relationships. But is human existence really so dominated by the political? By submitting to this domination, don't we already foreclose the exploration of other forms of human sociality? It is important to note that even within one of the foundational texts of political philosophy, we can already detect clues that point us toward other possibilities. In the first lines of his treatise on politics, Aristotle declares that the polis, the city-state, is only one among several kinds of human koinon, of community, another of which is the oikos, or the home. Unfortunately, however, the analysis he offers of the home is the prototypically patriarchal one, a definition that has been influential throughout Western history. Not only does Aristotle claim that the home is encompassed within the state, he intersects these two communal spheres in the figure of the patriarch, who establishes his dominion over the domestic sphere through a process of, do of domination and domestication, and who establishes the science of oikonomos, or economy, to order the household and to acquire property. However, Aristotle supplements this patriarchal analysis of the household with a second definition. The household is not simply the locus of domination, but more fundamentally, it is the association where people come together to attend to their everyday needs and wants. He cites ancient writers who affirm that the home is the communal space where people become companions through the activity of eating together. So how are these two definitions of the home as the sphere of domination and the sphere of need related to each other? Now Hannah Arendt uh, sort of gives a typical answer. She collapses these two definitions arguing that the vulnerability of the body, uh, the vulnerability of bodily need is our primordial experience of being dominated and that our need to dominate these needs and uh, our need to dominate the needs that dominate us is the reason why we need to elaborate structures of hierarchical political domination. I would argue that it is precisely this correlation between dependency and domination which is most problematic and most characteristic of the patriarchal viewpoint. There's this repudiation of dependency becomes so absurd that many patriarchal thinkers even conceal the fact that we are born unto women. Thomas Hobbes, for example, inaugurates the modern conception of citizenship by comparing the political subject with mushrooms that spring out of the ground fully formed, emerging as isolated individuals who can freely establish contrasts, uh, contracts and uh, uh, submit to rulers. Now, aren't there different ways of understanding the vulnerability experienced in individual and social life? Can't we embrace a non-patriarchal vision of the home as a site for the enactment of responsibility for the needs of ourselves and other people, as a place for caring, refuge, and hospitality, as a model for empathetic sociality? Couldn't the affirmation of such social nurturance subvert the hierarchical and antagonistic logic of the political. Now in order to consider these alternatives, it is useful to return to the critical interventions of feminist ethics. These analyses are interesting not because they posit some feminine essence, but rather because they have engendered a fecund critique of the patriarchal system. According to Nancy Hartsock, the dominant powers in any society